May all of you be welcome to this lecture about Gnosis. Uh, last week we talked about what Gnosis is, and today we're going to talk about the awakening of consciousness, which is one of the objectives of the Gnostic teaching. Uh, this Gnosis uh, is it's, it's not this Gnosis um, related exactly to, well, it has its days in the, in the time of early Christianity or the esoteric Christianity. Uh, but this is a type of contemporary Gnosis delivered by Master Samuel Obeol. And he unveiled all those uh, teachings or secrets that were unveiled to the most common, to most of people, because Gnosis somehow is a teaching delivered for uh, a special group of people that has certain maturity for the inner development. But what happened is that due to the time of the generations in which we are, due to decadences and all the moral decay and all these degenerations that we have nowadays, is when somebody is sent to deliver a message that it is the, a message that is very revolutionary, but we want to transcend, we want to change uh, the, the condition, the crisis in which humanity is, especially in the psychological aspect. Uh, that's why, as we mentioned in the previous lecture, that Gnosis is knowledge. And this type of knowledge, it's, it's called inner knowledge. Uh, as a fact, it is a type of inner knowledge because it deals with anything or everything that happens within your inside. Most of us, most of the knowledge, most of the information that we have, all the knowledge that we have to move ourselves in the external world, we have a lot of information. So that's why we go to university, we go to schools, we have all this academic uh, education that help us to gain our daily breath, to know how to find a job, to have you know, a position, which can help you to survive and, and get your income. So in order to, to live well, let's say it that way. Uh, but this type of knowledge does not really transform the person. As I mentioned it before, when I was a child, I used to think that, to think that psychologists, doctors and teachers were the happiest person in the, in the world because of the level of knowledge that they might have and because they have gone to school and because psychology has studied about the mind, uh, behavior, and because teachers, they do know how to teach. They also have to learn a little bit about psychology. And because doctors, they know about, you know, how people can live well, how can they take care of themselves correctly uh, how can they have a, not only a physical health, but emotional and psychological health. But reality has shown, has demonstrated that it's not that way. We have seen psychologists, we have seen doctors, we have seen teachers, that their lives are very complicated, difficult, and miserable sometimes. So, but not only, that, not only they are the exception, I mean, we all of us have uh, the things that I have described previously, but because people lack of inner knowledge, okay? And inner knowledge has to do with knowing yourself, directing your attention to your inside, to your thoughts, to your emotion, to your action, to your instinct, to your sexual drives, your sexual desires. So we, that's what Gnosis, there is a lecture called the five centers of the human machine. But today we're not going to get deep into that. We, I just mentioned that if you want to become uh, somebody who wants to transform yourself, there is no other way than studying yourself. And as we mentioned in the previous lecture, Gnostic, a true Gnostic student is someone who starts being introspective, is someone who starts directing its, his or her attention inward. With the, with the purpose of understanding the nature of mind, with the purpose of understanding the human psychology. And the only way to understand your own human psychology 
is by directing your attention and putting into practice what hypnosis is called self-observation, self which is a sense that is being, because it hasn't been used, it's, 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 not, it's malfunctioning, it's not really functioning. We do have that sense, but through the practices of meditation, concentration, focusing the attention in one specific point. So it is, all these practices enable us to direct uh, the attention and to have the capacity to see, perceive the mental activity and gnosis goes a little bit beyond that. You, 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 you just not, I mean, you just not only, you just not only see the mental activity, but with a little bit of insight, uh, that, that insight comes from your own consciousness when you put it, when you activate that consciousness, so that you are able to identify what psychological defect is it's projecting that thought, that emotion, that action, that instinctive uh, mood that we might have, or that sexual drive. So we can really, through consciousness, when we activate self-observation, we will be able to discriminate, okay? What is making us to act or behave in a certain way? What is making us to think such and such and, and such and such things? So that's why gnosis is profoundly inner knowledge. It's not, that's why when we said in the previous lecture that gnosis is uh, experiential knowledge because the knowledge about yourself, you will not find it anywhere else but within yourself. So that's why we as a, as a association, of Gnostic association of Gnostic Anthropology, we said that we are anthropologists in the sense that we study the human being in the first person because you cannot study uh, who the people is because you're not able to. It's, it's by knowing yourself that will enel, enel, enable, you, enable you to know others. But obviously, we are not, we're not gonna spend time to know ourselves in order to, to see what the other person, to know the other person. But just automatically by knowing, because we all have the same psychological patterns, we all have the same psychological behavior. Some of us are more oriented uh, some, some of us has more, uh, let's say, some psychological effects are stronger in one person than in the other. So reason why uh, we are different. So we have, to, we have to know ourselves. And once you know yourselves, as we mentioned it before, you will be able to know the gods and the universe. So, but in order to de deliver knowledge or self-knowledge, we need to focus on what we call the awakening of consciousness. The awakening of consciousness, it's, it's something that has become very popular nowadays. So as a Gnostic institution, we will approach this topic based on the lectures delivered by Master Samaya Lombero. And we're gonna start by Introducing the topic, uh, let me project it in the screen. Okay, so let us, all of you be welcome to this lecture about the awakening of consciousness. As we mentioned, we belong to the Gnostic Association of Anthropology from the United States. Uh, this association is also in other countries, especially in El Salvador, where it's, we have the headquarters. And so we have, we have, we have a question, have you ever think about exactly what consciousness is. Okay, this is what one of the points that we're going to talk about. What is consciousness? And then as a definition, Master Samael said that 
Consciousness is a cognitive faculty of the being, a faculty of apprehension or cognition. So in other words, consciousness is the capacity that enables, it's something that enables us to, to perceive the world around us, whether it is external or internal, but consciousness is, is a faculty that let us know the exterior and the, and the interior world. As we're gonna discuss, because uh, uh, let's say, for example, you have some consciousness, you have visual consciousness. You have visual consciousness because you are able to see the color, the shapes, the forms, the perspective, and then so, in that way, you are conscious that there is an object that has a particular shape, that has a particular color, that has a particular form. In the same way, you have an auditory consciousness, which enables you to discriminate sounds. Uh, that way, you know if something is far away or something is very close to you. If, if something might be threatening to you or something that might make you happy, uh, uh, something that might um, make you feel comfortable if you hear, if you hear a nice music or if, if you hear somebody telling you good words, something nice, or you might be scared because somebody is threatening you. Because you have that consciousness, that auditory consciousness, you are able to have some knowledge of your surrounding, and you have some knowledge of if your life uh, is in risk or if you are safe in any given moment. So in the same way, we have a tactile consciousness. So we have a smell consciousness. We have a taste consciousness that enable us to taste, you know, if something is sour, if something is sweet. And this is, all of this consciousness it's related, to, related to the five senses uh, allow us to have knowledge, to have a cognition, okay, of the external world. And that faculty, in this particular case, when we talk about consciousness, is referring that is a faculty of the being. So one might think that that um, because you have the five senses, is the physical body who perceives the external phenomenon, and one might think that because we have a mind, it's the mind who perceives the, the external phenomenon. But it is our being through those five senses that have access to the external physical world, okay? So, and through other senses that we're gonna talk about later on, uh, which are the inner senses, as we mentioned ourselves, observation is one of the faculties that can, can allow us to have a comprehension or a cognition of what is happening within our interior. So it's through the inner senses that we will have, um, cognition or we are going to be able to perceive the other dimension that there are, okay? Uh, we have the astral plane, the mental plane, uh, the causal plane or, or the other dimension that probably there are names in different esoteric group in, with a different name. But as we mentioned, consciousness is a cognitive faculty of the being, a faculty of apprehension or cognition. So let us observe also another uh, something that Master Samael expresses in his book, The Secret Doctrine of Anahuac. He says, Gnosis is a very national functionalism of consciousness. Gnosis is a very national functionalism of consciousness. Uh, well, uh, in order to explain this, uh, let's say, let's put it this way. Let's say that consciousness is something and gnosis is the is the capacity to perceive things that make you to be aware of things so in other words consciousness is a uh, consciousness is the soul and gnosis is the functionalism is the capacity of that soul to perceive all the phenomena around you and within your inner world within your interior so Sometimes the word gnosis and consciousness, they will be quite similar. But uh, in this case, let's say the consciousness is the soul, and gnosis is the function of the consciousness that enables us to perceive the inner world and also the external world. So, 
So today, these are the objectives for this lecture. One of the objectives will be to present the idea or concept of consciousness. The other objective will be to illustrate some ideas about what it's like to be asleep. We also, we're going to present some implication of being awakened to, to, or to have an awakened consciousness or to be in an awakened state of consciousness. We're going to present what is needed to initiate the awakening of consciousness. Okay, and so we have some definitions that these are uh, definitions not from the Gnostic perspective. The two previous one definition that we mentioned are Gnostic, but these ones are uh, definition that we have found on internet, okay? And one of them says consciousness def defines the knowledge that an individual has of his thoughts, feelings, and actions. So it's not distant from what the Gnostic uh, definition is because if you have the capacity to have access to your thoughts, feelings, and actions, and if you are able to see them uh, through the conscience, so then we would say that you are a, uh, an individual who is conscious. Because let me clarify something. One thing is to know something, and one, another thing is to be conscious of something. Just to give you an example, uh, you know that everybody knows that everybody breathes. There is nobody who does not know that you have respiration, respiration, or that you breathe. Everybody, everybody knows that you breathe. If you are alive, for certainly you know that you are breathing, but to be aware of the breathing requires that your attention is directly to the process of feeling the air going in and out, perceiving how your thorax expands and the abdominal area expands through each, uh, each every time that your breath goes in and every time the breath goes out. So that way, uh, only if you sense that, we will say that you are aware of the breathing process. But most of us, we just simply know because as you can see through, since we started this lecture, you haven't been aware of the breathing process. You know that you breathe as information, but Gnosis is experiential knowledge in the sense that you don't need to be aware. Or, I mean, you are, you have to be aware of the breathing process at all time. In that way, your center and your attention is focused within you, but generally we forget about the breathing. You can be momentarily uh, aware of the breathing process, but then you will forget because your attention will be distracted in someone else. So then you lose the consciousness of that breathing process. So in the same uh, situation, uh, we have to be aware of all the mental activities, but what happened is that we are not able, uh, you might be in a condition with you, you really are, you really know that you are angry for, angry, for example. But what will happen is that if you go in, if you want to go deeper into the sense of activating your, your consciousness, you really direct your attention and you start sensing all the physical reaction that are associated with the, with the anger. And you can perceive the thoughts that are manifesting in your mind. And you can observe the way you move to, to, due to the anger that you have at that moment. And you can really detect if you want to really, if you, if you are very instinctive, if you want to really just say something uh, negative to somebody, or if you really want to get it to the point in which you want to kill the person. So all those things are but are needed to be observed. Uh, observe means just to be neutral, but, uh, but you have to be aware of what's going on. And in that sense, because we don't want to reject what we think, but we don't want to also identify ourselves with what we think or what we do or what we feel. We just simply want to get the knowledge. And once your attention, your consciousness is directly to that anger, automatically you're gonna gain some comprehension without the mental, any mental process or any mental activity. Because if you just place your consciousness 
and you become aware, feeling, sensing everything that is happening within you, you will get an insight that is, it, it will flow through your conscience and you will grasp the comprehension and, will, and you will be surprised to find out that all the things that are expressing through your physical human machine are pushed or moved, not by you, but by your psychological defect. Okay, so as you can see the next definitions, the, uh, as such the word gnosis comes from the Latin consentia, uh, from the Greek word synaidesis, and then it is composed by the prefix sin, meaning with, and a desis we translate as knowledge. So that means with knowledge. Uh, I'm gonna bring another example. Uh, some of you might have read about Atlantis, for example. Some of you might have read about uh, life in another planet, for example. Or you might have read about past existences or what people commonly know as reincarnation. You might have a lot of literature and you might be, you know, very knowledgeable about, about uh, those topics. Knowledgeable, knowledgeable in the sense that you have a lot of information, but you have not experienced, you have not, uh, through your inner senses, you have not proven or investigated through your inner senses the information related to the Atlantis, the information related to reincarnation, for example. Because most of us, uh, it's very funny because many people from India, because of the culture, because of the religion, they do believe in reincarnation. But if you ask many individuals who are from India, if they are able to remember their past existence, their past life or the previous reincarnation, most of them don't know. Because they do know intellectually, but they don't know from the Gnostic perspective meaning that they have not, they don't have the inner senses that enables them to have that type of knowledge in which they can even remember exactly their past life, how was the life in, in the Atlantis continent, the lost continent, uh, if there is life in other planets. I mean, it's just mere intellectual information, but we don't want that, okay? Well, it's do, it is needed, it is important, but as, um, as a basic level, because we do need to have some intellectual knowledge, but we, with Gnosis, we need to go beyond that. We need to really investigate and prove things through our own experience, okay? That's why it's very hard to people who are uh, uh, aseptic, uh, people who don't believe in, in metaphysical things because they lack the consciousness or the inner senses to, for them to be able to prove these uh, topics that have to do with the inner knowledge, with the inner world, with the inner dimension, with the inner anatomy of human being, and all those metaphysical aspects. So as we were mentioning before, Gnosis and consciousness, we're gonna talk about that. So if we say that the word awareness we would say that is Gnosis. Gnosis is awareness, awareness is Gnosis, consciousness is Gnosis, Gnosis is consciousness. It's just different terms for the same action of being conscious of different things, whether it's external or whether it's internal. To witness is Gnosis. Objective verification of, the, of, of things, of the phenomena, of the laws of nature, uh, objective verification of divinity once you are able to prove those things when you awaken your consciousness so you have direct verification and also direct experience that what it, we, we define as gnosis or we define as consciousness in just in very simple words right so to know knowing witness objective verification direct experience of things are related to gnosis as we mentioned before, Gnosis is a very natural functionalism of consciousness. In other words, uh, trying to paraphrase this thing, it's, it's like if you say that sight 
is a, fun a natural functionalism of the eyes. In this case, gnosis is a natural functionalism of consciousness. So the capacity to perceive the external and internal world is gnosis. And that capacity belongs to consciousness. Okay, the function of consciousness is to know, to be able to be aware. The act of knowing is gnosis. Okay, this is the definition that Master Samael uh, expresses in the book, The Awakening of Men, in chapter two. And this is very important because it really gives us idea that most of us, we consider ourselves to be very conscious. If you are very academic, if you, if you, for example, uh, if you go to university school, if you have a, a bachelor degree, or if you have a master degree, people will consider these people to be very conscious. But that's, but that's not true because from the Gnostic perspective, the definition is it is a very particular kind of apprehension of inner knowledge, totally independent of all mental activity. So which means the capacity to apprehend the inner knowledge does not depend to the mind, does not depend, depend uh, to the five senses. So we need to develop what is called uh, consciousness in order to have access to the inner knowledge. As we mentioned, totally independent of all mental activity. That's why, that's why in Buddhism, in, in, in yoga, or, or the Hindu tradition, uh, all the emphasis is to quiet your mind, to silence your mind. So through that silence, what we are, what we're doing is we allow the consciousness to have the chance to manifest it, how to be awakened and to be able to perceive the things without the intervention of the mind, because everything related to the mind has to do with the culture in which we have been involved. Everything related to the mind is what we have been told. The mind cannot know, can only know the things that have been told, the things that, have, that, have, that they have read, or that they have, or what the, we have perceived through the physical senses. But we only uh, study to the mind, we're able to perceive only the external part of all the phenomena in nature. Okay, so we're gonna just uh, take a little time to talk about what apprehension is. Uh, just to clarify this, most of the time when we experience that when we when we study if you want to do a mathematical problem obviously that you have to do a lot of so if i tell you okay what is 25 plus 7 minus 47 uh, plus 100 what would be the total so if that would imply a lot of processes you have to add you have to subtract and then you have to do a lot of different mathematical uh, uh, functions uh, uh, or, or you have to be able to solve this problem. It will take you some time to do it. But just to give you an, ex an example of this situation, it happened that a man from India, he just, uh, he went to, he was with a mathematician and the mathematician, you know, he wrote a mathematical problem, a little bit complex mathematical problem. And he asked uh, this, this, this gentleman, can you tell me, what the answer to this mathematical problem is. And he just barely closed his eyes and he gave the answer. But the mathematician was, but, but or the teacher, I'm not sure if it was a math teacher or it was a mathematician itself. But the, the, the teachers asked, but how can you tell me the answer if you have not done the process? But he said, well, I just, I just know the answer. And then, can you prove uh, let me, so the teacher did the math solved the, the, the mathematical problem and as a matter of fact the answer that was given by this gentleman 
was correct, but he was not satisfied with that. And then, okay, this, the teacher said, let me, let me give you another mathematical problem. So he tried to make it a little bit complex. And he was starting, the teacher was starting to write a mathematical problem. And before he finished, the gentleman over there said, the answer is this. But then the teacher said, how, how do you know the answer? If I haven't even uh, written the, uh, the math problem yet. But the guy said, well, you know, as soon as you start thinking about it, it just automatically flow to my mind what the answer is. And then, so, and then, you know, the teacher finished completing the, the problem and he verified that the answer was exactly as the gentleman told him. So, but how could that happen? Well, that happened because the gentleman somehow, some part of his inner being uh, gave him the information because the being knows everything. Okay, so that, but the, if, you, if we compare the difference, apprehension is something that comes suddenly because as Master Samael said, it's a apprehension of inner knowledge totally independent of all mental activity. So what happened is that the, the teacher, obviously he was trained to do the mathematical problem. He used the analysis, he, know how, he knew how to add, how to subtract. And I'm not very good at mathematics, so we have some fractions over there. And everything is done through reasoning, okay? So you're using the mind to solve the problem, but the other gentleman didn't. How could that be possible? Yes, it is possible if you have your consciousness activated, if you are an awakened individual, okay? Those things, so it's like grasping things instantly without any mental activity uh, that, you know, sometimes the mind is, but basically the mind is very limited, but for the aspect of the inner knowledge, the mind is useless. If the mind, I'm not saying that the mind is something bad, but the mind is something that it is usual in one sense. But the problem is that we don't use the mind. The mind is using us. So we are victim nowadays of the mind. So that's why in Gnosis, what we want to do is we want to switch. As you will see later on, we have a chart in which we uh, compare what's the nature of mind, and what's the nature of consciousness. But we will see that later on. Okay, so inner knowledge. So what, what do we understand? I think we mentioned some of it before, but when we talk about inner knowledge, so your thoughts are inner, your emotional are inner, uh, your instincts are inner, your desires are inner. Uh, the, to have access and, and move in the inner world or what people call other dimensions is inner knowledge. To know about the inner human anatomy, which is not vis visible to the five senses, uh, it's, that is one form of inner knowledge because you, we have an inner anatomy that is not known to the, to the scientists because all they can, can investigate is, it, they can only investigate or analyze things that are visible, things that they can perceive through the five senses or things that they can per, uh, measure through technology. But beyond that, they don't have access to the inner knowledge. So inner knowledge, uh, it's sub, uh, because we live in the inner world, which is very rich. Most of us, we live in the inner world because we are thinking about different things. We have, we're having a lot of emotional emotions. We're moving to different places in the mind. We're visiting people. We're doing a lot of things in the mental plane. But most of the time, that mental activity is not related to what we're performing in the physical world. So sometimes we are eating. We are eating, but we're, you know, at the same time watching the, uh, um, YouTube, a YouTube, a video on YouTube. Sometimes we are eating and watching a video on YouTube and at the same time talking with the wife. So in that way, which other things are you doing? You're, you, I mean, there is not coherent because we say that if you want to be conscious, you have to be aware of one thing at a time. You cannot be divided, okay? So that's why we don't have access to the inner knowledge. 
even though we might be, uh, let's say, aware that something is happening. So let's say that we are very sad at any given moment. We know that we are very sad. But the inner knowledge will be that you really sense everything that is happening within you consciously without rejecting or accepting what's happening. You just focus your attention and try to be aware of what's happening. And once you start observing the mind, you will gain access and you will find out that that emotion that you are having or whatever is making you to be depressed, start to dissolve in your mental plane, in your in your mental in your mental in, uh, flow, it will disappear. It will dissipate. And then, what will be the knowledge of just being an observer of that? The knowledge will be that whatever we have is temporary, and you will see that everything that is projected in our mind is a projection. It's not reality. When you start observing, observing and observing whatever you're feeling at that moment, thinking at that moment, all those thoughts will dissolve and disappear. And after that, that emotion, that feeling, that depression that you have has gone away. What will be your inner knowledge of that experience? Well, the knowledge will be the result of that will be that everything that is in the mind is just a mental projection. That the suffering that you have it was there because you keep feeding those thoughts. You were not observing your thoughts. Most of the time we feed those thoughts. We, every time we think and think and think and think, we are just reinforcing those thoughts. And those thoughts are driven or moved by psychological defects. Okay, so that's why Master Samuel said that the best way of thinking is not thinking. Just an example, right? So there are different things that we can discuss about. Okay, mental activity. Okay, when we think of, when, when we say mental activity, what are we talking about? Basically, we're talking about thoughts, okay? Voices that we hear, sounds that we hear in innerly in our mind, uh, mental, uh, very uh, abstract. Sometimes you have like fear, sounds, that comes to your mind. Analyzing is mental activity. Logic belongs to the mental activity. Reasoning is mental activity. Uh, criticizing other judgment has to do with mental activity. There are many things related to the mental activity. So that's why uh, we have to be observant of all those mental processes that happen within us. So that's why when we reason or we, you know, philosopher, most of the time, they try to figure out, um, philosopher, they try to figure out what truth is, what beauty is, and all, of, all the tools that they're using is the mind. They're, they are reasoning about what life is. They're reasoning what the truth is. They're reasoning what divinity is. They're reasoning what beauty is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera but they are limited because the mind can only know things that belong to the physical world. That's why consciousness come into uh, a, a special role because to consciousness, you do can understand what love is, what truth is, what uh, beauty is, uh, and all those things I mentioned before. Okay, like religion, God cannot be proven to the mind. God can only be experienced through consciousness. Divinity can only be experienced through consciousness. That's why we need to develop inner senses that will enable us to have access, to have a comprehension of the inner knowledge without any mental activity. As I mentioned before, the sole purpose of Buddhism is to quiet the mind, awaken the consciousness, so that you can experience, experience reality as it is. This comes from the book of Master Samael. He said that consciousness, uh, we, uh, he's contrasting here the mind and consciousness. So Master Samael said that consciousness is more direct, allowing us to experience reality of any phenomena 
of every any phenomenon in itself and by itself. Okay, so we don't have the intervention of the mind. So, like for example, if you are Hindu, if you are if you are from uh, let's say uh, Pakistan, or if you are from Israel, if, uh, if you are from different nations, your perception of divinity, the idea that you will have will be according to what you have been told. But through consciousness, when it is awakened, you will see reality as it is, not as you have been taught. Basically, this is the main uh, intention that we want to experience reality as it is, not as we have been told or how the mind may interpret the reality around us and inside of us. And then Master Samael continues saying in his book, natural phenomena in no way coincide exactly with the concepts form formulated by the mind. Okay, this is something very clear. Most of us, we think we have concepts, we have ideas about reality, but we want to go beyond that. We want to really be Gnostic in the sense that we want to experience in our own with a clear mind so that we can have 100% objective information of reality. Okay, we'll make a comparison. So in one way, conscience is, should, be, should be active and the mind should be passive. But let me clarify this. Nowadays, things are the other way around. Now they, the, mind, the mind is active and the consciousness is passive. It's passive because it's asleep, but if we are in an unconscious state of mind, okay? So we need to awaken our consciousness because the true nature of the mind is passive. It has to be like a mirror in which everything that is seen is that we see the reflection of things as they are. But because the mind has become active, we don't see reality as it is. We just perceive it as we have been told or as your ego interpret things, okay? So that's why the true nature of mind, as we mentioned, is active. That's the true nature. So through meditation, what we want to do is to switch. We want the mind to be calm so that our consciousness awakens and becomes active. So that through the conscience, we can be able to perceive reality as it is. So all the effort, all the efforts done by all uh, enlightened masters all the effort is, is to help us to become awakened, to activate our consciousness in its totality. As you can see, consciousness is attentive. The mind is not attentive, it's inattentive because the mind is constantly wandering in one thing in another. You cannot, the mind cannot be stable, the mind does not have the penetration that the mind, the conscience has because that uh, the consciousness is very attentive. It's really focused, okay? So if you see a Buddha, and if a Buddha is looking at you, he will be fully attentive to you, okay? He will be observing and perceiving you. He will not be, not like we do, like we are talking to somebody, but we're thinking about something else. We're thinking about what we're going to respond to that person who will be, hearing that person in order to respond to whatever he's saying or to react to whatever he's saying. Or we might be with the eyes open and hearing, but where our consciousness or our mind will be in another place, okay? So that's the idea that the difference that we want to clarify here within the, the mind. See, consciousness is a faculty of cognition but the mind simply is a supercomputer that manages data. Just accumulate information and manage, but it's not a faculty of cognition. The, the, the mind can only function according to what it is programmed. Far beyond the program, the, the mind, the computer would not be able to function or to resolve the problems if it, if it hasn't been programmed before. So the same issue happened with the mind. 
and through conscience we ex we have direct experience of things and with that in mind we generally have borrowed borrowed experiences what we hear what have, we have been told what we watch on youtube on google etc etc and the the conscience simply reflects whatever the, the consciousness perceives does not go through the process of interpretation, analy analysis, reasoning, judgment. Simply the, the consciousness perceive things as they are without any judgment in favor or against. In other words, uh, the, the consciousness is able to perceive things as they are, not as we think they are like in the case of the mind, because the mind is the one that projects. So you, if you have, uh, uh, you project your idea, your concept, your own opinions, opinion of others, and that's the basic nature of the mind. And we have the nature of consciousness. So as you can compare, so this is an idea just to clarify what will be the difference among the two, the two elements here, conscience and mind. And this is from the Great Rebellion, chapter six, from the book, The Law of Pendulum. The, the, the Great Rebellion is the book written by Master Samael. And it says, the mind only knows the illusory forms of nature, but it knows nothing about the truth contained in such form. So generally we are very superficial because we just look in one aspect of reality, which is the external form. So we know see we go beyond that, okay? So we are able to see, it's like saying that if you have a, 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 a telescope, you will be only able to see the, the visual aspect of planet, galaxy, and all those things. But if you, re, if, you, if, you, if you use a radio telescope, you will, you will be able to perceive another, another aspect of the space of the universe, because what you are what you are able to see with a visual telescope, what a normal telescope, whether it, whether it is a reflector telescope or it is a, a refractor, you will be able to see the physical aspect related to the physical wavelength. But with a radio telescope, you will be able to see something different, other aspects. So the same aspects that happen with gnosis. Gnosis enable us to see the invisible part, okay, or the inner part that is contained in nature. Okay, well, this is in English. Uh, uh, so these are, uh, these are some examples of activities that the mind performs. And you know, the mind is very talented in this function. Generally, the mind is a specialist in analyzing interpreting, associating, judge, making judgment, deduct, you know, make logical deduction of things. So the logic send, project, memorize, uh, decline, uh, accept, uh, agree or disagree about things. So the mind only processes data. The mind cannot experience the reality of things. Well, if you have any question with my pause, and, and I will be happy to answer to your questions. And, you know, just to give a pause because I think I'm running a little bit. Oh, this is something we already saw, but this is in Spanish. Okay, we're gonna talk about the state of humanity. A master, as Master Samael mentioned in his book, he mentioned that it is urgent that we know that humanity lives with a sleeping consciousness. What do we understand by sleeping consciousness? Why is it urgent to know? Well, it is urgent to know because if we don't awaken, we will be, we will be kept prisoners of our own ignorance. We will be kept prisoners of 
the ignorance of society. We're going to be slaves. We will not be able to see reality as it is. We will be caught in the dream of the consciousness, believing that we are living. There is something that I used to say that most of us will exist, but we don't live. Living will be that you are fully immersed in the reality. But most of us would exist as machine moving around, but without being aware of what you're doing, what you're thinking, what you're feeling, what the real phenomena of nature is about. Okay, so that's why it is urgent to know. Unless you wanna, you're happy with the life that you have, that you wanna be yourself, you know, dreamy, unconscious, and be, you know, exploited by others, by religion, by society, by politician, by your husband, by your father, your mother. See, you need to be free in the sense that you need to become awakened. And the, in, in the process of awakening, it's a very difficult task that challenges the whole uh, personal, family, religious, cultural, and national, or, uh, or let's say, uh, planetary system. Every time you want to be an awakened, you become a, revol a revolutionary in the good sense, right? Because I don't want to say revolutionary, like the type of politics uh, revolution that in which there is blood and alcohol. We're not talking about that type of revolution. Okay, so we do everything asleep. That's what Master Samael mentions. And, and it's something that can be proven if you start like uh, developing the sense of self-observation. So Master Samaya said that people work dreaming, people walk the streets dreaming, people are born, live and die dreaming. Because we think life, we don't live life, we think life. Every time we're evaluating, oh, this should be this way, this should be that way, this should not be this way, okay? Because we have a lot of concept about what, how life should be. When we say that we live, we live and die dreaming, it's because there is there is a lack of connection of the experience that you're having here in the physical world with the mind, with the emotion. There is not coherence. Sometimes you're doing something, but you're thinking something else. So when we talk about awakening of the consciousness, that means that all your attention is brought together to the activity that you are performing to act to that thing that it is really important at that moment. That's why, you know, it's very popular nowadays to say that, well, you can, uh, you have to live the present moment. You have to live the moment. You have to live the present. That is something that is very common nowadays. But there is something that needs to be clarified because if you are watching me, if you, well, you are in this room, for example, or you are too soon, your focus of attention can be either to my person and you're paying attention to what I am speaking, or probably you, you're putting an attention to an image. You're putting attention to what's written. Uh, you're putting attention to somebody that is calling you at that moment, or maybe you're thinking about something else. So obviously in that moment, you are present. We don't doubt that you are present, but your attention is not really placed to, to that, that, to that what is important, okay? So in this case, if you are listening to this lecture, you have to be really focused and concentrated on, on my words, on, on the things that I am saying. But if for a moment you are like, for example, thinking about what you have to do tomorrow, so then you are dreaming because your, all your attention is, you're presently here with the eyes open, but your mind is in a different place. That's what we refer that when you are dreaming is because there is no a conversion of emotion, thoughts, and action in one thing in specific. Okay, and have you ever wondered in which moment in life you awaken your consciousness. Sometimes we have moments in which you feel very conscious, okay? And this is what Master Samael tells us. 
rare, very rare are the moments when consciousness is awake. The intellectual animal works, drives, car, marries, dies, etc., with the conscious totally asleep, and only in very exceptional moments awakens. Okay, well, this is something that I remember something uh, that really made me to be awake. Somebody one, one day, I was coming from a Gnostic lecture when I was studying to, to study Gnosis. And I was in the train station and somebody put a gun in my head and requested me to give him the money. And at that moment, you know, I was like fully present. I wasn't able to be thinking about something else. All my attention was concentrated. I felt my heart. I, at that moment, I really knew that I had a heart. <laughs> and I was very conscious. And, you know, the, the state of fear, you know, made all my adrenaline, adrenaline run through all my body. So even though I was, I had fear, but I was totally awake at that moment. See, because that intensity of the situation demanded me to be totally aware of what was happening at that moment. So the same situation would be like, like let's imagine that you are in, a, in an airplane and you decided to jump, well, you jumped for an airplane with a parachute and the parachute. So once you jump on the airplane, my question is, will you be able to be thinking about what to do tomorrow, what happened to you yesterday? Are you going to be interested to know if, if the clouds are made of helium or hydrogen or gas? Or will you be concerned about what happened to your family? Will you be able to, to be thinking about your health at that moment? I don't think so. You will be fully with your eyes open and totally aware that you are in a space and you are in a very special situation. I mean, that will put you in a state of, of awareness. Automatically, you will be very conscious. You will, at that moment, you will really not only exist, but you will be living, experiencing, because the situation has put you in a situation where you have to really awake. So those are the exceptional moments in which the consciousness awakens, at least momentarily. But if you have had an experience like that, you are, you are totally immersed. You are really living the present moment. If you jump from a parachute and you see yourself, you know, like it opens and you notice that you're falling down. I mean, you are really totally immersed in that activity. You, you don't have chance to think. You only have chance to be there alive and enjoy if you have to enjoy it. <laughs> or fear, and I mean, I have a, but at, in either way, you will be totally at least um, conscious. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter the percentage of consciousness that you have because we have 3% of consciousness and enlightened master is 100% of consciousness, but at least that um, little amount of consciousness that you have will be present at, uh, at those exceptional moments. So those are the only moments in which we awaken. And of course, you're, you, there are moments of awakened consciousness when you train yourself in meditation, when you practice self-observation, in which you consciously, willingly, uh, through your own will, you direct your attention to the inside, and then you observe your, 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 your thought, your emotion. We would say that then that you are conscious because you're activating your little amount of percent, uh, percentage of consciousness to be activated, to be able to perceive that 90% of unconsciousness. We do things in a sleepy way. Okay, yes, you mentioned it before. Uh, we do things in a sleepy way, meaning that all the things that we do, we do it mechanically. We don't do it consciously. Even if I do this movement with my hand, if I feel sense and I have my mind directing this movement and I can sense it, that would be a conscious activity. 
Okay, so we I will be moving my hand consciously. That's why all those techniques like Tai Chi, Qigong, all the idea of doing this movement is that you feel, you sense whatever you're doing through those exercises is to bring your consciousness and to be aware. Okay, so if you're eating, for example, you should be putting all, placing all your attention to the flavor, the, the taste, the temperature, and, and the texture of whatever you're eating. You smell what you're eating, you're sensing, you can see when you're, you can feel when you're, when you're, when you're chewing and that thing is solid and then it's becoming watery inside your mouth. Most of the time, we don't do that. We, when we are eating, we're chewing, but doing something else. We're speaking with somebody, reading something or doing other things. Just to give you some examples. And as we mentioned, we awake in exceptional moments. All right, so I just mentioned it before, I gave some examples. Okay, when we have come to the conclusion that everyone lives asleep, we understand the need to wake up. So it is necessary for us to understand, to experience, to be awakened for a little moment, and then automatically we will fall asleep. And if you keep yourself awakened, I'm gonna give you an example in a moment and you, you keep your awareness active for a moment, and then you fall into the state of sleepiness, you will really tell the difference, what it feels to be awake and what it feels to be asleep. Okay, so as, a, as, as, a, as an exercise, uh, I will request you to, to be aware of the breathing process for about five minutes. As you, as you listen to me, as you are aware of me, you have to be aware of your breathing process. Okay, so let's start doing that from this moment on. And you will notice after a minute or a few seconds or maybe two or three minutes, that you will forget that you're breathing. And then you will regain again the consciousness of the breathing. And then you will hold that breathing for a little bit of time consciously, but then you will forget. Something will, go, will happen in your mind that will distract you from being aware of the breathing process and being aware of my presence here or what am I saying, okay? So until then, if you do this exercise, you will realize that what we're stating is true. We're, we don't have the control of our attention is the mind that drives our attention, whatever it wants. So the mind's it's and the mind is controlled due to our psychological effects: anger, lustfulness, anger, pride, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the ego will drive you to whatever its interests are. So that's why, uh, with that little example, with that little exercise you can really find, um, discover that you cannot have a continuous flow of attention. That means that you can have a continuous flow of awareness. And that's the main point. That's why uh, in, this in this studies, we highly emphasize to develop attentional skills, concentration, meditation, so that, that way we train our consciousness to awaken and to keep to keep it awake for a longer period of time. That's why we awake, then we fall asleep. We awake, we fall asleep. But that's the way it is. We are so used to be unconscious that it, it, it has become a mechanism, a, a mechanical thing that happened, automatically happened. So that's why we need to develop uh, a training your attention. So like the word meditation, which is bhavanga, or Bhavan, I think is the word in, in, in Sanskrit, that has to do with mental training. We need to train our mind. This is how in the Hindu, or, or, or the, uh, sometimes I confuse Hindu, Hindu, I don't remember the religion, but most yogis and, and, and Buddhists, 
uh, they use the word mind when they refer to consciousness. Uh, that's, that is correct because an awakened mind is consciousness. A mind that is asleep is unconsciousness. So that's why consciousness, uh, we use the term consciousness hypnosis referring to an awakened mind. Okay, so we need, we have to develop the understanding that we need to be awake. Why do we need to understand that we need to be awake? In my personal case, I need to be awake because if I'm not awake, I will not be able to identify who is ruling, who is making me, who is making me think, who is making me act. Okay, because most of the time people do think, but they don't know that what they're doing is wrong. They don't know what they're doing is not wholesome. Okay, so through consciousness, if we awaken our consciousness, we will be able to, uh, to identify that our actions are wholesome. Okay, or we can identify if our, our actions are unwholesome. So that means that we will be creating pain to others, creating pain to ourselves creating suffering to ourselves. So that way, uh, being awake will enable us to really know what is moving behind us. And once we, and once we are able to know what is behind that, so we gain some self-knowledge about ourselves and we will identify that whatever is pushing us to do, to, to do things or to avoid doing certain things is driven by psychological effect. It's not driven by our, by our conscience. It is driven by our ego. So we don't want to be a slave of the ego. We don't want to be a slave of the dream. We don't want to be a slave of mental projection. We want to really experience reality and really become happy individual, truly happy, because true happiness is not a temporary happiness. But we can talk about that later on. So, but the importance that we need for uh, Awaken our conscience. So we, 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 don't, we don't want to be in the shadow. We want to see reality. We want to be able to perceive, perceive reality. Unless you are satisfied with this Maya, Mayavic world, I mean, this world of illusion, well, you're fine there. But if you are kind of rebel, you want to experience something different, you want to, you don't want to be more of the crowd. So you are welcome. You are welcome to start awakening your consciousness. Okay, and this is what Master Samai Mael states in his book: People confuse consciousness with intelligence or with intellect, and the very intelligent or very intellectual person they give the qualifier of very conscious. So if you are an intellectual person, if you are very intelligent, uh, people, are consider, uh, people consider those people to be very conscious. Well, definitely I'm not saying that being intellectual is something bad, to be intelligent, you know, to do business, to be successful, to solve problems, which is good, I'm not saying that, but that does not have, that's, it's nothing that has to do with the consciousness, okay? And what happened is that you get well-trained, well-clarified, you have some, um, some faculties that enable you to think or perform in a better way than other person, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you are awakened. That, that doesn't mean that you are a very conscious person. If you don't know about your inner self, if you don't know about who you are, you might have all the information about the, the, the world. You might have all the information related, intellectual information, but you will not be somebody to be considered awakened. You will not be somebody because you lack of the inner senses that enable you to see reality, to see things as they are, and to see beyond the five senses or perceive things beyond the five senses.
And this is uh, what also Master Samael states in, in his chapter number two from the book, The Awakening of Men. The faculty of consciousness allow us self-knowledge, okay? So remember, we have consciousness as a faculty and we have consciousness as a soul. Either or refer to a state of being able to be aware, okay? So if you if you are uh, if you have the faculty of consciousness, of if you awaken your consciousness, you will be able to 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 gain self knowledge about you. You will really know who you are at any given moment. You will know who is really manifesting in your soul at any given moment. You will really experience that you are a divine spark, not because somebody told you, but because through that uh, awakening of the consciousness, through that faculty, you really perceive yourself as part of divinity, okay? You're not something uh, apart from divinity. You are a divine human being, but that only can be experienced if you develop the faculty of consciousness. Consciousness gives us knowledge, uh, um, I think I misspelled something. So consciousness gives us knowledge of what is, where it is, of what is really known, of what is certainly in all. Let's see each one of them individually. Okay, faculty, that means that that is like a sense, the ability to perceive. Self-knowledge has to do with what you are internally, okay? At this moment, we're 90% ego. We are 3% consciousness. So through this little 3% of consciousness, we need to activate it to be able to perceive the 97, 97%. So the, in that way, we are able to know uh, our unconsciousness and as we grow developing and increasing our level of, of consciousness by eliminating the ego, so we will really one day be able to perceive us as what we really are, okay? And we are divine human, uh, divine individuals. So the faculty of the consciousness give us knowledge of what is. As we mentioned before, uh, if you see a plant, a plant, a tree over there, you're looking at the form. But with consciousness, you can go deeper and see what's inside of that plant. You can see not only the physical aspect of the plant, but the inner part of that plant. You can see what we what we known in Gnosis as the elemental of that plant. And you can even perceive the divine aspect of that plant. Because when we see a tree, we think we just see an object there. We just see something there. But through the faculty of the consciousness, we can really see the true nature of things or what things really are. Not just mere pieces of wood, uh, branches, leaves, uh, fruits but with, with the faculty of consciousness, one can go beyond that and experience, experience uh, the three as it is, just for, for giving an example. Okay, um, I want to go back to knowledge of what is. Uh, at any given moment, let's say for example, if you are with your friends, something will manifest in a different way than if you are with your family, okay? So if you are, for example, smoking, you will become really, you will have knowledge of what you are at that moment. You are someone who smoke. If you are someone that you want to kill somebody, you will really become aware that you want to kill that person because most person, most people, and this is proven by psychologists or by psychiatrists that most people, when they are in a state of anger, they kill others, but they're not aware. They become aware after they have performed or done 
the crime. It's until then that they realized that something happened that was not under their control. And just to give you an example, imagine that uh, you have your wife or your husband, either or, and you enter and you go to your house and you find your husband or wife uh, commit, committing adultery with someone else. At that moment, of you become angry, jealous, your 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 ego is being touched deeply, and at that moment you grab your weapon, your arm, and you you know boom boom boom. You shoot at your wife, your husband, and 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 the other person that is you know the adulterer, the, the the person that is committing adultery with your wife or husband, and you you know with all your rage, uh, then you boom boom you kill them. And after you finish all your bullets in the gun, and then when, once your ego manifested and, and that anger was discharged, after that you say, you realize that you did something wrong. At that moment, you didn't have the knowledge of what you were at the moment. You were, and, 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 and you were anger, you were hatred but you were not aware. You became aware at the moment that your ego said, okay, I did what I needed. And then the ego releases you. And then the, bit of, the little bit of consciousness that you have enters once again and consciousness see what has been done. And then what will happen? Your reaction is bad, you feel bad, you feel miserable, guilty, you want to run away because now you are aware that something horrible has happened. But while you were shooting at that person, were you aware of who was manifesting at that moment? What was manifesting at that moment? You were not, you were asleep. You were under the, under the control of the ego. And these are the things that hypnosis emphasize. So that we have to put our consciousness in front of the impressions that we are able to manage the situation. But most of the time is the mind and the ego who are involved who, who receiving the impressions so that way, the consciousness is not really aware of what it is doing or what it is at any given moment. And knowledge of what it is. Okay, this is very important because if you have the faculty of consciousness, you will be certain if you are in this three-dimensional world, in this physical plane, because most of the time we have experienced this in the, in, the, in the world of dream or what is called the astral plane. And we move in this astral plane, but we don't know that where we are. We don't know that we are in the other dimension. And sometimes we are in the mental plane or the mental dimension, or, and, and we don't know that we are there because we are asleep. But if you have the faculty of consciousness or if your consciousness is awakened, you will really tell that you are in the physical world, that you are in the third dimension. But if you are aware, if you have the faculty of the consciousness, you will be able to tell that you are in the astral plane. For example, just to give you an idea, in the physical world, if you pull your finger, it will not move, it will stay there. But if you are in the astral plane and you consciously do this, you will see that that finger extended, stretches. If that happened, you should be, if you are awake, awake a little bit, you will realize that you are not in the physical world because in the physical world, that phenomena cannot happen. It can only happen in the astral plane and the other dimension. So knowledge of what it is. We are certain of where we are at any given moment, in which dimension we are moving in. Knowing what is really known, okay. So we will be able to know, we, we can give certainty of the things that we have proven. You can, for example, I can, for example, start talking about uh, the Lemurian continent, for example. I can talk about, I can have information about, but that's not really known to me because I, up to this moment, I haven't had an experience, even through meditation, even or either for by astral travel or with you know the higher senses that you can develop through meditation, you can perceive 
the continent the moon and investigate how the life was and all things. I just have read some information, but this is something that is not known to me. It's not really known. I just have some intellectual information. But through consciousness, if you have the faculty, you can go and study in the memories of nature, in the Akashic, Akashic records of, in the memory of nature, and you can find out and, and know by yourself about the Lemurian uh, continent, for example, or the Mu continent, how many people call it also. And the same we can say about your past life. You can really, if you are awakened, if you have the faculty of consciousness, you just do a retrospection and, or you use different mantras to want to, to activate your chakra that will enable you to see the, your previous life. So then you can witness what you were, if you were a woman, a man, how you die, how you die, how was your previous life, et cetera, et cetera. Acknowledge of what it is and more. Okay. Uh, I mentioned this because you will find a lot of people that have the problem, which is called um, uh, mythomany. I think that's the word, yeah, mythomany. There are people who believe that they are the reincarnation of Archangel Michael. They are the reincarnation of uh, Jesus. There are people who really start like you know, believing that they are, they, they really ignore that they are not those things. The, I don't know if I make sense with this. So like, for example, if I know something, I'm very sure, but if I don't know something, so the consciousness will allow me to be sure whether I know something or not. But most people, because of their unconsciousness, they already believe what God is. They have talked to God already. They have already, uh, they see in their dream, because in the other dimension, they project their desire. So whatever they perceive is not the reality. What they're perceiving is what they think they are. So most of the time we ignore. That's why we need to be fully awake to stop dreaming. And once we stop dreaming, we will be really conscious of what we know, but also we will be conscious of what we don't know. Okay? So that's what is Master Samael is uh, trying to teach us. Okay. Only the conscience can know itself. Okay, for example, sometimes people, oh, I know this person very well. Or say, oh, I know my father. Oh, I know my wife. I have lived for like for 20 years. Well, that's a very <laughs> funny thing because you don't even know yourself who you are. And then you start stating that you will know the person. I think that's not something serious. Master Samael said that revolutionary psychology teaches that only man himself can come to know himself. You can now, I only can know who am I. Nobody else can do it for me. I cannot know the person, who that person is. Obviously, when you start knowing yourself, it will give you, uh, that knowledge of yourself will, will give you the knowledge of how, of, of, about other people. But our major concern in the Gnostic teaching is to know yourself, to really become an studious individual, dedicated individual to gain inner knowledge. That's the main purpose of this teaching, because if you don't find the inner knowledge about yourself, who you are, so you will not be able to know the universe and the gods as it is mentioned in Adelphi, in the temple of Deifal, in the Greek temple of Delphi. And then also we're gonna read this text. It says, only we can know if we are conscious at any given time or not. Man himself and no one, but he can realize for an instant, for a moment, that before an instant, before that moment, he was not really conscious, had his consciousness buried asleep. Then he will forget the experience or keep it as a memory, as the memory of a strong experience. Okay. Uh, for example, you're observing me. 
And you might think that because I'm giving a lecture about the awakening of the consciousness, you might have the idea that I am conscious. The only one who can tell if I am conscious or not is me. It's only me who can tell if I am aware of the moment movements I'm doing. It's only me who can be conscious whether I am being aware of what I've been saying, of what I am feeling. It's only me, it's only me who can really tell that, that the same as the same happens. So if I'm watching you and observing you, only you can know if you are aware or not. Unless you are an awakened master, you can really identify who's asleep or not, but in our condition, it's not possible, okay? So only for an instant, for example, remember that I told you to be aware of your breathing conscious for five minutes? Uh, only you can tell whether you were awakened or not, if you were conscious or not of the breathing process. Only you can tell if at that moment you lose your consciousness and then you regain that consciousness. I can, no one else can tell you that you are aware, you are unaware, you are conscious or unconscious. It's, it's just only you. It's, it's just only you, I'm sorry. Then also like sometimes if you have an, an experience in which you are awakened, like the example that I gave you, uh, when, when you jump in a parachute or when you are in a very dangerous situation, so you might like be awake, okay? And in my case, I always have like very fresh that memory when, when I was assaulted with a gun in my, and they put a, head, a gun in my head. I have that, you know, like it, once, every time I remember it, it's just, I have very vivid, very vivid images and sensations of what happens because that experience was not deposited in the memory, okay? It was deposited in my consciousness. Of course, we do have a, what we call a memory has to do with the mind, but retrospective mindfulness is something that has to do with your consciousness. So we have a retrospective mindfulness. It, is, it, it means that we have a memory of a conscious experience, okay? So that's why uh, we might, forget that experience or we might keep it you know as a very strong experience in our memory and this is something related to the consciousness we don't have a continuity of consciousness our consciousness as we did the exercise that i told you to be aware of your breathing process uh, for a few seconds you were aware feeling the air going in and out the air going in and out, and then something distracts you, can be a thought, an emotion, an action, something that happened in the exterior that distracted you from having your attention focused, concentrated in the breathing. So that's why we don't have a continuous flow of consciousness. And it is our aim to train through concentration, mindfulness practices, meditation, self-observation, et cetera, et cetera, that we want to train our consciousness to be kept awakened for a longer period of time. As you are training yourself, as, as you train yourself, as you develop the capacity or, or, or you increase your amount of consciousness, so that consciousness will be the, 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 the continuity, the continuity of that consciousness will extend for a longer period of time. Then you might fall asleep, but then you awaken again and you continue the flow of attention continuously. Uh, your attention will be continuous. That will be, they will be awakened and aware continuously without losing the attention. But that will be something that it needs to be trained that we have to achieve through life. And it's nothing that is easy. It requires a lot of effort and it requires to be training yourself all your life. It's not happened that happened. It's not something that happened spontaneously. Of course, there are people who have very quick advances in the awakening of consciousness, but that those advances or, or, or this advance or this progress that is done very quickly is because this person in previous lives, they had been training themselves in, in, the, in, the, in the process of awakening their consciousness. So it's not something that, that's why some people it takes longer for them to develop this faculty. And there is people who takes them very short period of time to awaken. Like Master Samael Umbeol, he when he was born, he was already awakened. 
he has a very big amount of awakened consciousness when he was born. So he was able to perceive you know, the other dimension. He was able to have astral travel without any difficulty. He have clairvoyant, he have all this faculty that enable him to perceive the inner world. I think this is something we already mentioned. Uh, we awaken in very exceptional moments. So this is one of the situations. Uh, this is just one example. What would happen if we woke up? We're talking about a hundred percent, you know, that at any given moment, your consciousness wake up to a hundred percent. And Master Samuel uh, describes the following. The life of the human being is a life of sleep, but he believes that he's awake and would never admit that he's dreaming, that he has a sleeping consciousness. If someone were to wake up, he would feel frightening ashamed of himself. He would immediately understand his antics, his, ridic his ridiculousness. The li this life is frighteningly ridiculous, horribly tragic, and rarely sublime. So, because if you become totally awakened, you will really see all those stupid things that we perform, the negative thoughts that we have all the cruel reality that is within us. Imagine uh, somebody that is boxing and at the moment that he's in the ring and he's fighting with somebody else and his conscience is awakening, he will run away after seeing that, what is the sense of being hitting one another and seeing all the people, all the crowd, you know, cheerleading or, or cheering at you or, or, you know, at that moment, that individual will feel very embarrassed to see that what he's doing is really not a common sense. He might be transcendent for the ego, but for the consciousness to be hitting one another and entertaining people and making fe people feel happy or sad because you are punching somebody's face and knocking it down on the floor. I mean, it would be something stupid. Or, and so in that way, that's why uh, I think it would be for Spanky. Uh, they mentioned that that's why we are not allowed to awaken consciousness at once. It has to be a gradual process because as soon as you start awakening your consciousness, you will start perceiving all those negative things that we have that you don't even suspect that you have. You will be horrified to see all the cruelty, the negativity, that you don't have idea of who you really are. Once you awaken consciousness and you go step by step, little by little progressing and awakening by eliminating your ego, at the beginning, we see just the superficial aspect of that. But once we go deeper into the subconsciousness, we will discover our horrible reality. The, we might be very, in the physical world, we might be very beautiful, or handsome or sympathetic individual. But if you were have the capacity to see our real inner condition, you will change your mind. You will really be scared of who you are and who the other people around you is. Okay, so. The objective of the Gnostic teaching basically is awaken our consciousness. That's why we talk about these things. That's why we make an effort to give techniques, practices in order to be able to awaken, to work hard in order to become a different human being. Uh, people might try to change their behavior. People might want to might start doing something like drinking alcohol, like uh, stop committing adultery. Uh, some people, when they enter to churches and they somehow they change some habits, externally they live a normal life, but internally they still have those subconscious elements that make them perform 
negative acts. That's why in the Gnostic teaching, we don't go just suppressing actions, but we want to eliminate them so that once they are, once those element, negative elements are eliminated, we can flourish. All our virtues, all our good qualities, all those wholesome qualities that the consciousness expresses, but those, uh, those uh, values from the consciousness do not express themselves because we are embattled in, the, in our psychological effect. And then just to continue with this, 10 or 15 years of study in school, college, and university are useless. If we leave the classrooms, we are sleeping automatons. We are sleeping machines, automatic machines. It is not exaggeration to say that through some great effort, the intellectual animal can be aware of itself for only a couple of minutes. And that's what happened uh, when sometimes some yogis or, or Tibetan monks or any other monks who spend a lot of time in meditation, they are able to, you know, take out their consciousness from the ego and experience the shamadhi or experience what we call the bhakti, the emptiness, or however it's called, because there are different names for that experience. And, and they experience reality for them. Well, what happened is when they return to the physical body again, it's like the gene, you know, the genius or gen the genius or the gene that is in the, you know, I don't know how to say that the, where you rub and then the gene comes out of the, of the lamp and then, and then the gene gives you three wishes that he can give you, comply or provide you anything you wish, the three or three wishes. And then what happened is the genius gives whatever you want, but then the genius returns to the lamp or, or that, I don't know how to say it exactly in English, but he returned to that thing where he is enclosed. But the best thing to do is not to rub it to time and, and, and let the genius, the gene come out. But the best thing to do is to break the, what is containing the genius. So that means the best thing to do is to eliminate the ego that has imprisoned our consciousness and when that consciousness is liberated totally by eliminating the ego. So you will, you will enjoy to have a continuous flow of consciousness. So you will become Christ, you will become a Buddha. But because you might have some short experiences of Shamadhi, that doesn't mean you are an awakened. You have a brief moment of awakening and you experience reality and you experience joy, happiness, happiness. But when you return to the physical body again, when the consciousness returns and is in prison in the subconsciousness, you continue being the same individual. You train yourself to liberate your consciousness for, for a moment. But the best object, the best thing to do is to liberate yourself totally by eliminating your psychological defects that are the ones that increase on your consciousness. Okay, we're almost finishing. Uh, what is meant to be awake? Uh, well, what implies to be awake is if you don't have to be a forget, if you are a forgetful person, you are asleep. So not being forgetful is to be awake. Those are, you know, to be awake implies many things, but just to give you some hints, some ideas. Know what period, period of the day I am in. Because it happened the other day that we were in a, in a, in a meeting and it was around 10 o'clock. And then uh, one of the persons in the forum said, oh, good night. And, and everybody said, good night. But if it's daytime, why is he saying good night? He's not aware, especially what he was saying. But sometimes it happens that you don't know if it's day, if it's afternoon or it's morning. So sometimes not to know what period of the day I am in, it has to do with being asleep. So if you know what time of the day you are or which period of the day you're in, it's that you are awake somehow. If you know the time, well, you need to know more or less 
what hour of the day are you in? Because sometimes we lose consciousness of the hours during the day. Uh, a space, it has to do with the physical space. Sometimes you you are in a library, for example, like I am here now, but then you for a suddenly you lose consciousness of where you are. You say, well, what am I? Okay, those are some of the aspects that has to do with being awake. A, a space related to dimension, a uh, dimension. Okay, that has to do that. If you are aware that you are in the physical, you are aware that you are in the astral plane, that you are in the mental plane, that you are in the causal plane. So that means if you, you really are aware, if you are an awakened individual, you will be able to know in which of the different dimensions of the universe, of the universe, you are moving in. Just to be able to see the activity of the mind is, oh, is to be awake. To see your emotional state through self-observation is to be awake. In Gnosis, we highly emphasize in the letter F and G and E. But most of all, if you be become aware of your mental activity and of your emotional state, and if you make a uh, good effort to be aware of those mental processes and those mental emotions, you are in the right track, okay? Because you might know if you are in another dimension, you might know that you are in the astral plane. You can know if you are not forgetful, for example. But if you are not, if you're not able to see, to observe your psychological defects, then you're not going nowhere, okay? Because our psychological defects are the main cause of our unconsciousness. That's why we need to focus, we need to concentrate on, on seeing the activity of the mind, becoming an observant of the activity of the mind, become an observer of the activity of the emotional states. Obviously, later on in the Gnostic teaching, we will talk about how to eliminate the ego. But since the topic is awakening of consciousness, we want you to be aware of those things because once you are aware, aware of those uh, egoic or, or ego manifestation so you will be able to comprehend your your inner condition you want to understand who you are so then you will be able to eliminate that but we need understanding we need to discover our psychological defects in order to eliminate them but we need to have the ability to perceive them we have the uh, we need the ability to be able to study them Okay, as you can see, age uh, is related to what I was mentioning before. See the aggregates or psychological defects that the idea that originate the emergence of, of, of the thought, the action and emotion. Remember oneself, feeling the body, perceiving inner activity, send yourself as the consciousness. This is something that I don't want to touch it because it requires just one specific lecture about that. But just to give you an idea, just to make it give you an idea. Remembering oneself will be, as the exercise I mentioned before, perceive your breathing, sense that you are living, that you live, but at the same time become aware of the object that you are perceiving. In this case, if you are perceiving me and listening to me, it's good to have the perception of me, but it's never, it is, uh, it is always recommended that you never lose the sense that you exist that you are perceiving me. One thing is to see something, okay? And one thing is to perceive me. So self-remembering implies that you're perceiving yourself, you're sensing yourself while you're, you're watching, while you're listening, while you're doing something, while you're sensing to the touch something. So that is a special training that is quite difficult to develop, but it's not impossible. Living in the moment, living in the now, the here and now. So living the moment, as we mentioned before, is to pay attention to what really needs to be paid attention to. If you're eating, pay attention to that eating because that's what you're doing. That's what requires your attention. That is your right mind. Or also the other one is to stay in the state of mindfulness, meaning is that you have to be aware, fully attentive of what's going on in your surrounding, a little bit beyond, be attentive, be perceiving yourself and a little bit beyond would be, if you do the three process at the same time, 
and observe what is manifesting within your psychological aspect. Okay, so I think it has been too much information for now, but we will discuss about each of these topics in later lectures in a, in a specific way. So just to remember, awake, and I want to thank you for being part of this lecture. I really appreciate your presence and we hope to see you in later lecture. If there are any questions, so you are more welcome to, to do, to make them. So and we will be here to give a response uh, according to our capacity, but we will be very happy to share any information related to your inquietudes or your doubts or curiosity as well. Thank you very much.